Well everybody, this is Clint Lockler again going in the second part of the series is trapping and snaring mostly mental masturbation and we're going to go on this a little bit further. If you haven't seen the first video, I really recommend you go back and watch it because it may kind of surprise you some of the stuff that I said. If you're going down the route of the, you know, the YouTube survivalist or the disc primitive type survivalist we're using sticks and, you know, deadfalls and, and, you know, really crappy snares and stuff like that. You may want to go back and look at that so you'll kind of understand what we're going. Now where we're going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to take that a little bit farther, guys. I want you to at least open your mind up to the, the understanding of the right solution for you. Whatever that is, that's the right solution for you. It's not going to be the same for me, I almost guarantee it, but that's totally okay. There's no silver bullet, there's no magic answer to any of this, but when we're trying to come to a solution, we got to have the best data that we can. And I know, just like you, I'm a big reader. I've got boxes of books, bushcraft and woodcraft and old camping books from the 1800s and early 1900s. And Raymond Thompson, if you don't know who he is, he's the one that, uh, he's got several books. And he was the original person that started with a steel snare after using cordage up in Canada. I mean, fascinating stuff, the way that they lived and they got their food, all of that. And when you read that, that data is building up inside of your brain or your computer, and that's what's going to start giving you the data. But what you have to do is you have to sit back and go, is the world the same today as it was, you know, in the 1800s? Was it? Or is it? See, that's a, that's a, that's a very different way of looking at this. Is the, the human being the same today as it was back then? Is the data that we're researching giving us the wrong conclusions about people that actually survived in the wild? You know, if you're automatically just looking for techniques and techniques, see, techniques is not a strategy, guys. That's a technique. You need a strategy, which you can design that to get to the solution you want. So the first one is, was the world the same? You know, it's not. So if you're, you're basing stuff off of 1800s, early 1900s, we don't live there anymore. You know, you, and some of the stuff I've read goes back to the 1700s. Really good to read, not very practical. And here's the reason why. When's the last time you've seen a two million uh, count buffalo herd running across the road in front of your car? It's not there anymore. Most people, when you look up the, the, the resources, they'll say between 30 and 60 million buffalo. When you figure out how much a buffalo weighs and how much the average meat is, you know, you, you times that by say 45 million because that's in the middle, so it's a decent average, not one way or the other. That comes up to like 13.7 trillion pounds of protein on the hoof that we no longer have. That makes a big, big difference. They used to go from Canada, Buffalo did, from Canada to Florida, and from Mexico all the way over to the eastern coastlands on the Atlantic coast, the eastern coast. That's a big range. That affected the way everybody thought because you're looking at a 3,000, 3,500 pound animal that if you really need a lot of good fat and meat, there it is. That's not here anymore. Elk's the same way. You know, elk used to be all the way from British Columbia to South Carolina. You don't think of it that way today. And all the way to California to, and to Mexico. So elk were everywhere. Here where I live in Tennessee, we had elk all over the plateaus around me years and years ago, but they're not here anymore. That food source is no longer here. And a lot of the techniques and the stuff we read about people are from when that was going on. So we got to use the right data. You can go back and look in the early 1900s what ducks and geese hunting was like in numbers. I mean, just think when they talk about geese and ducks darkening the sky and being so loud you couldn't scream or hear it and you couldn't hear a gun go off next to you. That's how much racket and how big these flocks of ducks and geese were. You don't have that anymore. You know, but a lot of the books we're reading are from that time period. Now, let's think about some stuff that we do know about today a little bit. Muskrats, when, when you know, I'm 47 years old you know, you go back 40 years ago, you talk to anybody that was trapping at that time, any kid could go out on about any day and catch muskrats almost anywhere in America, including including a lot of the, the what we consider desert states of today. 
Muskrats were everywhere by the billions. And they're not there anymore. There's some, there's pockets, but there's a lot of states, people, they, they, at a first sale, they may get like 22 muskrats, where they used to get 22,000. So that's changing with it. The beaver numbers are drastically reduced now. You know, they seem like a lot to us, but compared to what it was back in the mountain man time, and these things went from the you know Atlantic coast all the way over into New Mexico, and maybe even California, those numbers are down too. So you gotta keep that in mind. Just think about the frogs. If you're my age and you remember going out to ponds and goofing around as a kid around ponds, man, every single body of water had great big bullfrogs on them. We'd go out and gig them and fry them up. And that, you do that now, that's like, in most parts of the country, you might as well be going out and hunting for unicorns. I mean, to hear a frog, or at least one that's big enough to, to gig and a bullfrog, they're rare on, you know, all over America. You know, and a lot of these food sources that I'm talking about used to be so plentiful, no one ever thought about them because they were everywhere. The fish. You know, when I was in the military up in Alaska, if you had wheels and gas and a fishing pole, there was no reason to ever go hungry in Alaska. You could go get fish anywhere at any time of the year. It didn't matter if it was four foot of ice on the lake. It didn't matter if it was in the middle of summer. There was so much fish up there where, where it hasn't been like it is down here in the lower 48 that I'm pretty sure from the, what I can tell, because there's, there wasn't like people counting fish back then, but just the accounts of the availability of fish, we don't even have those anywhere in the same numbers that they did back then. All this has to take into account when you're thinking of what the proper application of design is for your solution. So, you know, the environment has changed. You know, I'm not into the global warming thing, but the environment's really changed. Just think about all of the really great wildlife habitat that supported so much animals and so much food tonnage that we no longer have because we levy up the rivers, we're, we, we've got rid of all the lowlands, so we can plant crops in them, you know, subdivisions, all that type stuff. But just our habitat alone has changed drastically from the information from the books that we've been getting in the past. So, you know, keep that in mind. And the rivers are a big one. You know, when, when they tried to civilize the rivers, they really hurt a whole bunch of the, the, the wildlife areas that were so heavily populated that's no longer here. Another one that a lot of guys seem to overlook, they hear it and they kind of know about it, but they, they, they overlook it, is our environment is nothing like it was when we came over from England. Nothing. And it is nothing like it was in the 1800s. It, it is so drastically uh, different. And, and most people don't think about this, but this is where, when I'm talking about designing the right uh, survival solution for you, so you always have food flow systems, this is where you have to take into account because the lessons from those people before us, uh, you know, there's a saying I like to say, it's called never, always remember the face of your fathers. It's from Stephen King actually but it's, it's in contents from uh, the dark tower and I've never forgotten that because this guy was trying to teach lessons to younger people. Don't forget the faces of your father. What the Indians did and what the settlers did and what the mountain man did, that's kind of like our fathers in this. And we, we, we want to know what they did but we overlook so many of the small stuff that's very, very important. So our environment has changed so much. Indians were not hunter gatherers. That is the biggest bunch of baloney that's been been taught to Americans and ever before. They were hunters and horticulturists. Huge difference. See, because foraging is you go out into wilderness and you just try to scrounge around and find something. That's not what an Indian did. Indians manipulated the environment around them by planting acorn trees where they wanted them, apple trees, crab apple trees, plum trees, cherry thickets, you know, blackberries, different root stalks. They planted everywhere they went, they planted that for future generations and they could go back to. So when they went out, quote, foraging, they were going out and tending plants and harvesting from those plants. Now sure, they would come across certain things out in the wild that they didn't have anything to do with and they would harvest them. But that is not what the Indians did is just go blindly harvesting out in the wilderness trying to find something. So that, that's one misconception people have about that. When the, the colonists got here, 
the environment we had was chestnut overstories. I want you to think about some, an acre of chestnuts, even the American chestnut per acre would put out somewhere around 3,500 pounds of nuts. Those nuts have the calorie of about 200, chestnuts have the calories of about 280 to 320, depending on where you get your information, per cup. And the chestnuts stretch from Maine all the way to the coast. There were stories that a squirrel could start in Maine and never have to touch the ground until he hit the, the Gulf Coast. Think about that. The stuff we think of as overstories today were scrub trees compared to that. And the acorns and everything, those were secondary trees. Well, now they're, they're, they're you know, canopy trees, but they weren't then. So that part of our environment changed. The Indians also did a lot of burning. They would burn. That's how we had elk here in Tennessee, because this is not terrain for elk. They would burn off the top of these plateaus around me to give the elk the right environment that they needed so they would have a huntable food source whenever they needed that meat. So it was like you being a rancher but on a very loose scale. They would burn places for deer, they would clear uh, undergrowth and, and, and big old timber because they realized a lot of that wasn't that very helpful to them. And they would have edges all over the place that would grow more plants. They would plant what they plant, wanted to plant there. And they were basically having, if you've ever heard the term food forest, a food forest all over North America. So when the Indians went and did the Indian thing, they were doing it in a, in a tended food forest coast to coast. Do we do that? No. Is America like that today? Hell no, it's not. I mean, we, we're, we're into uselessness. You know, no one wants to plant a real pear tra tree when they go plant a Bradford pear tree. I mean, good grief. Who would, who would want to have fruit in their own yard today? I mean, that's really the way that we've went. Very different from what they were seeing when they were there. Now, when the colonists came over here, well, we're going to get into the mountain man side. This is important. Colonists are from an agricultural background. Agriculture is field tending. You clear the field, just like we think of corn in Iowa today. You plant an annual, you harvest the annual, you clear the field again. That's not what a horticulturist was, what the Indians were. They, they moved plants around and they tended them and they harvested them. So you had two things, two different groups coming together when a lot of the information that we read was clashing because of that. And the colonists didn't understand that they were in a food paradise because they're used to straight rows and, and plowed fields. I can understand why they would feel that way. They would think it was untidy and this, that, and the other. And they just wanted to strip everything out and plant annuals because that's what they were used to from uh, when they come over from Europe. So when the mountain man and stuff started, you can see why it was very different than the Indians. The Indians manipulated their habitat because they're horticulturists. Mountain men are from an agricultural society, so they didn't understand or see what was around them very much because that's just not part of their growing up. So that, that's one of the, the, the main things that I want you to, to grasp because that's gonna come, I think, very important if you're ever really worried about having any type of long-term type uh, food system. And you might be surprised because trapping is not gonna be the only thing that I'm gonna be talking about just because I'm a trapper. Okay, now the, the last thing I want to get into before I get into the Indians and the mountain men in detail on this is guys, I hate to tell you, we're not men anymore. And I don't mean generationally. And this may come as a surprise. Like if you want to know probably where the highest testosterone is in America, go to an NFL uh, locker and test for testosterone. Besides what they're probably shooting up, their natural testosterone to do what they do on a daily basis is sky high. Maybe like the UFC, some stuff like that. Those guys are gonna be in the testosterone range of 800 to 1,000 probably. The average American is somewhere around 500 in testosterone when you measure it. Now you may be going, what in the world does this have to do with survival? The books you've been reading were about men that me and you cannot compare to. Sorry, we ain't the man. Back in 1910, when they started recording such stuff, 
they, an average American male had a testosterone that was 400% higher than today. So the manliest, hairiest, aggressive man you know today is 400% less of a man than an average man in 1910. That means they were tougher. They had a crazy sex drive, apparently. They would fight. They, they could handle a lot more pain. They could do things we couldn't do today because we're just basically less of a species. Now, as much as that may hurt some of your feelings that think you're all manly, manly, that's, it's everybody. We're in the same boat. Now, there's all kinds of reasons I could probably go into why I think that is. That's irrelevant. So when you're reading stories about guys that are doing things like the mountain men or the Indians, dude, we ain't them. You're not them either. You're not going to reproduce the Lewis and Clark. All of us that are watching this would be dead trying to do that. We ain't man enough to do what they did. So that also has to be taken into account of that. So that, that, that's one major thing I want you to understand. So the information you're getting from are from men that were way manlier than we were. Okay, let's talk a little about the Indian. Now, I've already told you the thing about the horticulture. That's not a small deal. That's a big deal. You know, and the, the thing is, now, if you're, if you're looking at sur just at survival, as in I get lost on an a, a elk hunting trip and I've got to get some food. See, having, um, working on primitive traps and that's kind of ridiculous in the modern world because you can probably find help. But the biggest lesson from that is, you didn't take what you needed to take to begin with. You should have had some modern snares with you if that was an issue. You definitely should have four or five days of rations and a way to get water when you're out there. That way, the food part of the survival situation is not really the main thing. When I'm talking about food survival, what if there's a pandemic, which has happened all throughout history and has happened in this country and shut the country down? So what are you going to do in a pandemic? Run out with all the people that are probably coughing and sneezing and dying everywhere and try to catch some squirrels. That's stupid. You should have food storage. That's basic prepping for anybody. If you're going to go out on a hunting trip, you're going to go somewhere where you're actually in wilderness and you don't have backup food and snares and guns and bullets, that's stupidity on your part. Not that you need to know how to try to get out of it after that point. Be a man about that when you start and have the stuff when you get there. So, you know, what I'm talking about is something more than just a couple of days when you're lost. That's not what I'm talking about. Okay, Indians. Interestingly, and there's two, you'll, you'll see there's two different things here that as this little series plays out, all these little pieces are going to start coming together like a cog in a wheel. 90% of best that the people that study Indians, 90% of the diet were from, in this, in this order, nuts, berries, roots, seeds, leaves, and then some shoots in that order. So 4% of their diet came from meat. So why am I even saying anything as a trapper? Because I don't go uh, trap nuts, or do I? See, that, that's where you, hopefully your brain's starting to click up. People that had to live in wilderness that manipulated their terrain around them to be more convenient to humans didn't rely on meat when we get into the mountain man side of this because they were horticulturists, plant tenders, and the mountain men were not horticulturists. They were from agriculture. They ate very differently from that. So the Indians, 4% meat. And if you'll notice, first thing is nuts, and there's a lot of oils in nuts, which most, most preppers and survivalists never seem to think about, which is the fats. You got berries and then some roots, which are starches, seeds again, which are going to be high in, in fats, and they're easily be obtainable in large amounts. So think about that. Think about uh, uh, what a squirrel is. Um, 35, uh, probably 50 calories, or mice. That's, that's a good one. You always see survivals doing mice, 35 calories of mice. Well, you get a cup of black walnuts, you're at 700 calories, a cup. That's why the Indians relied on the nuts so much is because they had their calories and their fats that were coming from something that were growing everywhere because they tended them to be that way. Now the mountain man on the other hand, they ate, well let me say something about, else about the Indians so, that, so you, can, you can get a grasp over this whole thing. 
what a survivalist thinks about being in the woods or if you know you, you always hear what if the government tries to do martial law or what if there's a race war or there's a, a pandemic or the grid goes down, whatever it is and you got to run off to the woods and you got your you got your go bag and you got your your survival gear in there you may have a, a bug out location you may have whatever so you're going to be out there somewhere when you're by yourself as good as the fantasy is and the way that we look at heroes in this country where the, something happens, they got to go through the challenges and then they're going to come back and, you know, and they're going to survive and they're going to be a better man for it and all that type of stuff. Not reality. That's, that's a story, a way of doing a story of heroes. When Indians were together, the reason they could do what they could do and the reason Indians only had to work a couple hours a day is because they had a team. Seals don't go into buildings by themselves, they go with a team. A survivalist would go into self because he wants to do everything himself and he wants to be able to say he did everything himself and he would die. Seals don't even do that. Now, Indians, you had people that were making uh, pemmican and were stretching hides while some were hunting, some were fishing, some were keeping the fires going, somebody was watching the babies, someone was making sure the horses were corralled, all this. So individually, as a team, they didn't go out and just try to be the lone survivor. Not in the Marcus Luttrell kind of way, but the way survivors think about being a lone guy out there surviving. So when you're looking at what the Indians did, that's a piece of data that you need to have squared away. They were not individualist. Not at all. They could not do what they did if they were individualist. They knew that. They were living it. So that's one thing. Now we're going to go to the mountain men. Now, mountain men almost entirely lived off of meat and fat. If you'll think about the, the beaver tails, which we'll get into, uh, you th if you look at all the French trappers that were during the mountain man age, when they went, their main thing they took was pork fat, pork belly. They had all kind of little crazy names they called them, porkies and all kind of stuff. They took the fat with them. Now, they ate lots of meat and they tried to eat lots of fat and they seemed to survive. Okay, you know, when a doctor says you got to eat your greens, you can't take a dump. Well, apparently it works because Mountain Man did it. So it makes you, at least makes me think the doctor know what he's talking about on that. But the Mountain Man seemed to survive and thrive on a mostly meat and fat diet. That's not a meat diet, guys. That's meat and fat diet. And I've got some examples of the fat here in a minute. Why that is so important. Now the journals show that they did eat berries when they were easy to harvest. But more importantly, which going back to the lawn survivor is a crappy a way to get to your right solution, is even the mountain men traded with the Indians for processed foods like bannock, Indian bread, fry breads, beans, corns, peas, and pemmican. And if you're thinking, okay, there's also some in journals where they took canned sardines. There was a um, Sir William Stewart that was noted for carrying sardines with him when he went out west to trap beaver. So it wasn't like it was purely everything's in my little bag or my backpack or on my horse and I just ride off into the wilderness. That's not the way that happened. Not in the real world. They, had, they were trading with the Indians to get stuff along as they needed. Lone Survivor is not set up for that. Okay. When you, looked at the, when you look at the historical parts of the trappers' forts, and if you didn't know this, most trappers were in troops. They were companies, per se, almost military-like. They'd go out in, you know, 50, 100, 200, and they would go and they'd set a fort up. So for defenses, and they, that would be the operation base. They'd go out and they'd trap the beaver. When you looked at the historical bases of the trappers' forts, cows were almost always there. That way... They could get milk, and more importantly, butter, and cheese. Now, they thought that was important enough to do, but we don't think that's important enough to do today. Should make you think just a little bit. Now, these are the rations in the troops that are documented, the trapping troops of the mountain men that are documented. And it was like one goose a day, that was their food. 10 pounds of buffalo or 8 pounds of moose meat because there's 
I guess more fat the way they were doing it. Three big white fish or one large salmon. When food was hard to get, the ration for one man per day was eight rabbits. Think about the volume there for men that are doing what men were doing at that time. On Lewis and Clark's expedition, it has been estimated that each man eat and burnt 6,000 calories a day. 6,000. Okay. Now another thing about the, the mountain men that most people don't think about, because you think about them, me too, when you think about it, you know, they get their musket, and they, they've got their, uh, you know, their, their little food stores and maybe some bacon or some flour, some coffee. And they got the horse and four or five, you know, big long spring traps. And they just wander off in the, in the wilderness. And that's kind of the way we think about it. But let's, let's look at, you know, they had cows. They traded for stuff when they were out there. And they were famous for, get this, taking large packs of dogs out into the wilderness, but none of the dogs ever come back. I'll let you put two and two together about that. All right. They loved prairie dog when they could get it. The meat was tender, but the, all the talk that they talked about the prairie dog was that the oil was superior because they have, you have to have oil to survive. And, and that was a major source for them. Now the other is the beaver tail. Beaver tail has been claimed to be the delicacy of, of the mountain men and stuff like that. Guys, it wasn't for flavor. It was for the fat content because your body has to have it. Now, if you, if you go out and you just try to catch a lean fish all the time, you're going to die if that's, if that's your plan. They would render down the oil. They would use the oil like we would use uh, WD-40 today, but they would also cook in that oil, and then they would you would sit there and roast the beaver tails so and you would eat it almost like a very cheap piece of bacon because you needed that fat it wasn't for the flavor i've tried it uh meat trappers tried it uh we both come up with the same same conclusion uh i thought it had a slight fishy type odor which is weird because a beaver doesn't eat fish but it was just like eating lard like i cook with today it was like eating lard I mean, you know, no matter if I rendered it or if I cooked in the oven or if I fried it, because I tried it all these different ways, and if I roasted it over fire to all the leathers cracking off and stuff, it's just eating a chunk of fat. It was a delicacy because they knew that if they didn't have it, they were going to die. Now, they did eat the beaver. There's a lot of talk about that, and, and that was very, very common, that they would eat the beaver, and most of them liked it, not as good as buffalo, but the others. But see... Kind of, but them, they had a support system around them. They were not lone survivors. Lone survivors didn't make it very long. That's why you, they, you know, they had the rendezvous and they had their friends and they had all that type of stuff. They went out with dogs so they could have meat when they needed it. They went out with cows so they could have butter. That is not what a survivalist is thinking about doing when he grabs his go bag and runs up the side of a hill somewhere. But if you're looking at and thinking, well, if the mountain men did it, are you taking a pack of dog and a Jersey cow with you? Well, then you can't look at what the mountain men did. You can't look at it because you don't have 60 million buffalo running around. You don't have elk running around everywhere. You don't have all of the environment in the food forest if you knew what it was from the Indians to take advantage of. So that's what I want you to think about, is what you're thinking and the information you've got. Is it based off, because most of the information in the woodcraft stuff comes from this area and a little bit later. And it's not the same world. We're not the same people. So, where's, so, so then if we know that information, how can we come up with a solution? So if we need to feed our family or we need to go to be able to supplement our own food when it's not drastic or whatever just because you lost your job, how in the world are you going to do that? It's probably not trying to act like an Indian when you don't live in Indian times and living like a, a mountain man because you don't have the support system that they did. Just something to think about. Just let it rattle around in there a little bit.